Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Hi, I'm Tristan Mentry, Program Coordinator at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. Welcome to Science Pub. This program is part of a springtime series focusing on gardening and plants. This series includes tonight's Science Pub with Dr. Daniel Geiger, Art Meets Science Medicine to the Mind, Botanical Block Printing on May 1st, and curated orchids and their care on May 15th. So check on the museum's calendar for more information. We also want to remind you to support your favorite local business, like our favorite Dargan's Irish Pub. OK, so Dr. Daniel Geiger joined the museum in 2004 and is now curator of melancholy. He received his award-winning PhD on abalone from the University of Southern California in 1999. He has developed a secondary research interest in the systematics of orchids, for which he holds an, a, um, an appointment as a visiting research scholar with the Huntington Botanical Garden and has served as a member and chair of the research committee, committee of the American Orchid Society. Geiger specializes in the systematics of small and overlooked groups. Um, marine micro snails, such as the little slit shells and the orchid genus Oberania. He is recognized for his expertise in light and scanning electron micros <laughs> microscopy. Thank you, Daniel. Take it away. Okay, hey, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. So today focus on orchids, microscopic oberonia. You see already a plant here as on the right hand side and a very small flower, maybe two millimeters in size. Now orchids don't really need much of an introduction. Everybody loves them, of course, whether those be the supermarket orchids, the phalaenopsis you see at the bottom right, the spidery dendrobiums at the top right, if you're a local naturalist and wandering around in the local mountains, you may even have seen some of our local stream orchids, the Epipactus gigantea. And then also I show you here Sarcoglottis sceptrodes, a little bit more of an oddball species, but one lucky patron may be able to take that home as one of our benefits of our May 15th event, just a little teaser there. So these rather large and flashy orchids are actually the minority of all orchids, and then is those which I kind of jokingly call the other 29,000. There are about 30,000 orchid species described. And so the other ones with rather smaller and rather oddball looking flowers are the majority. We have some tubular spiky orchids like Cresslerella. We have strange spiky ones like the Aenea. And we have really unsightly and small ones that are the base of the leaves like Triadella. All of those are maybe one centimeter large, maybe half a centimeter, so that's half to a quarter of an inch. And then we have right in the center, front and center, Oberonia, with possibly some of the smallest flowers amongst the orchids. Now you wonder how small is small, so I give you here a little idea. This is an American coin for those of you who may be tuning in from other countries. This is one dime, 10 cents. It's about one centimeter, maybe 15 millimeters in diameter, so half an inch or on that size. And the flower is just a part of that. And even to make matters even more interesting, this is one of the larger Oberonia flowers. Most of them are actually smaller. And so you may now, of course, wonder why Oberonia? And that question comes back to an interaction I had with Sandra Svoboda, a local orchid group a grower and member of the Santa Barbara Orchid Society, and also the editor of a premier orchid journal, the Orchid Digest. I would also like to mention and acknowledge that both the Santa Barbara Orchid Society as well as the Orchid Digest are kindly supporting our May 15th event, so you shouldn't miss that. So when I started out with the orchids, it was just a hobby. Fun thing, you see at the top right, I had a couple of terraria in my home, and I grew some plants in there that I obtained from some vendors. And one of the vendors said, oh, you know, I've got this particular species here. 
Um, and I don't quite know what it is. It has a name on it, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. So I thought to myself, hmm, you know, I'm a trained systematist. So uh, I can figure this out. How hard can it be to actually figure out one name of one plant? And that goes definitely in the category of famous last words. Eventually, then I also thought it would be nice to see, get some good images because the images that I could find on the web and in publications were not that great. And so I'm in charge of our electron microscopy lab. So I thought, oh, let's try some, take some pictures of these flowers and I ran into problems. So then I thought, okay, game on, let's see who's boss. And then I really started to get into it. And the sooner you know, I actually now, when I visit collections for my mollusk research, I not only go to the malacology department, but I then also head over to botany and you see me at the bottom right. This is a picture of me being the fishbowl at the British Museum of Natural History where the visitors are being put on display for, um, for the general public to have a look at what researchers are doing in the collection. And on the right hand side, you see all these letter soup and these are all the collections that I visited so far. So now I mentioned already that imaging is a big problem. And so I want to give a quick overview of the talk and start with how to actually take pictures of these tiny flowers. Then I want to move on and give you an overview of the diversity of this wonderful group talk also about the evolution and phylogeny and what we can learn from that. And then last but not least, look at what we are really the strongest in natural history museums about the alpha taxonomy. So who is who and how many are you? And this may sound fairly sundry topic, but actually it has some fairly far reaching consequences and I want to highlight those. So let's get into it fairly quickly. First off, so your iPhone is not going to help you with these small flowers. You need a little bit more right from the get-go. So the simplest version is a SLR camera. And because these flowers are very three-dimensional, we need to engage in Z-stacking. Fortunately, this can be done today with a motorized photo focusing rail at the bottom left, the Cognizus rail and we can control it all through a computer. So we push one button and require about 50 to 100 images that are then computer generated and combined. If you wanna stack it up a little bit further, we see here a stereo microscope and that's a little bit a better stereo microscope than what you see in high school. This is a research grade instrument. This particular model is from Carl Zeiss at EV20 and I also would like to acknowledge the Carl Zeiss company as one of the sponsors for our May 15th event. Again, here we have motorized focus on a column. We have it connected to computer. A single click will acquire a well-defined focus stack that we then further process. We can even go further and go onto a compound microscope and this is a little bit more experimental, as you can see by the uh, little bit less well-organized setup. Um, it is a little bit more ad hoc and it takes a little bit more effort to get that going. It's not a technique I use frequently, but it is available. Why do I do it? Because the optics of a compound microscope give me a little bit more resolution than with a stereo microscope. But talking of resolution, my preferred weapon of choice is the scanning electron microscope. Here we see already the scanning electron microscope in action with a couple of flowers on screen. This is our older microscope, the Zeiss Evo 40 XVP, and the newer one I will show you later. So this is quite a bit of a technology that I'm using to get pictures of just a little flower. Why do I do that? And this is a good question and it's rather unconventional in botany to use photography and electron microscopy to illustrate those flowers. Generally what is done is that one does line drawings as I show you on the left hand side. And so these, this line drawing and the SEM image of the, the very same species. I would like to draw your attention to the bottom part of, the, of these illustrations, that triangular or semicircular shaped portion. And on a drawing, you see a couple of dotted lines. If you could look over on the SCM, you see that this, in this position of the dotted line, there are actually folds of tissue on this particular flower. 
And so what you realize is that there are limitations to what a drawing can show. You realize this dotted line should indicate these folds, but you would never guess that there are these folds based just on the drawing. And so that's why I like to use um, images, photographic and electron optical images. Now on the left-hand side, this is an excellent drawing for this particular group by Gunnar Seidenfaden, a very well-established Danish botanist, well-respected in the orchid community. However, in some cases, as we see here in the illustration of Oberonia caprina, these illustrations are not quite as good. And I'll show you on the left the illustrations of that newly described species. On the right, I show you the very same specimen, but now a photograph of that specimen that I found in the Vienna herbarium. And the arrows that you notice there, they are showing the discrepancies between the illustration, the drawing, and the actual specimen. So what we have here is a misleading drawing. It's very clean. The lines are very straight and, and very easy to interpret, but they're just wrong. And that is a problem when you try to figure out what species are you dealing with. We can easily tell a bad photograph. It's out of focus, blurry, it's too small, it's too dark. All of that is easily recognizable, but a drawing, you cannot tell whether it's a bad drawing. So again, these are the reasons why I prefer these optical illustrations. Now that we have figured out how to image those flowers, let's look a little bit at the diversity of the group. First, how do you recognize those? They're fairly small plants, sometimes just about a centimeter or a third of an inch in size. The largest one can grow up to about 75 centimeters or two and a half feet with the length of the leaf. The leaves are generally compressed, laterally compressed, and opposite, they form, a, they form a, uh, a, a fan shape. The stems are typically sh short, and typically we find a monopodial growth. That means we have, like when a tulip, we've got a bottom, we've got the roots, roots maybe a bulb, and then we've got the shoot coming out straight away. Occasionally also sympodial, and that is, for instance, found in irises, where we have a horizontal shoot growing on the ground. And once in a while, it pops up some greenery and uh, makes additional um, parts of the, of the plant. You also will notice that the roots are fibrous. You see these little fine spaghetti threads in white on the board? These are the roots. And these are quite different to roots from our typical uh, household orchids, like a moon orchid, a phalaenopsis, a cymbidium, or maybe also a slipper orchid, a cypripedium or a paphiopedium. These are very thick and are, are quite different from those that are found in, in these Oberonia plants. If you look at the vegetative diversity, at the bottom right, we have two plants with a typical fan shape. To the bottom uh, left, we have one with a pencil-like shape with so-called tyreid leaves. But then some also have a little bit more extensive stems on the top left. And on the top right, we see even some with scale-like leaves, long stems, and very short protruding leaves from that particular stem. So it has quite a bit of morphological diversity. And that makes it actually also interesting from growing these specimens. That's how it all started off with. Recognizing it from the reproductive perspective, particularly from the flowers, remembering that the flower are the reproductive organs of plants. They have typically a single inflorescence, long, it's at the terminal, and it's coming, it's, it's flowing down. We have hundreds of flowers, and all these flowers have the lip, the red part in this portion, in, in this example, pointing downwards. They're so-called geotropic, so moving towards the bottom. And they are then also so-called non-resupinate. What does that mean? Orchids have a special feature in that during development, their flowers are actually rotating by 180 degrees along the flower stalk. So first the lip is on top, and then as the flower matures, it rotates around, and then the flower is at the bottom. And you can even see that if you look, for instance, at the Cattleya lelia orchid, if you look at the flower stalk, it actually has a twisting to it. Now, Oberonia are a little bit odd because they don't do that because of pendulant inflorescence to begin with. Another character is the so-called pollinium. That's another hallmark feature of orchids in that their pollen is not as separate granules like in most of the plants, like in oak, which make us sneeze, of course, but there are 
um, aggregated into masses, pollen masses, and that's what's referred to as a pollinium and a different type. You see at the bottom right, this is kidney shaped, has two parts of it, and that is a fairly good identifying character. If you look at the different flowers, there are all sorts of colors from cream, almost white, green, red, orange is fairly common. There are no blue ones, no black ones, but otherwise we have pretty much everything under the sun. Also the lip shape in particular can be quite variable. The orientation or organization of the flower on the flower stem, the rachis can also be quite variable from just plastered all over with overlapping flowers to scattered to some in whorls. And on the bottom right, you can even see one with spirals, spiral flower arrangement on the rachis. And in some cases, like in Operonia cylindrica, bottom left, we see that the flower is actually angled to the rachis. So there's quite a bit of variability. If you look at an individual flower, now this is under the electron microscope, we can recognize it is just a regular orchid flower. In the center, we have the column, the fused part of the male and female reproductive structures. Below it, we have the lip, which is one of the petals. Top left and right, two more petals. And in the back, we have the sepals, the secondary whorl of floral elements. Then the pediceled ovary, you see that at the bottom with very straight cells, so it's non-resupinate, it's not turning by 180 degrees. And then in this case, you have a very long floral bract, that, that, floor, that leaf that is subtending the individual flowers. The column itself, if you zoom in a little bit, is fairly standard for an orchid. Top, we have the anther cap, we have the stigmatic surface where the pollen is received. In some cases, we have even column wings. Now, let me quickly just give you an overview over morphological diversity. For instance, the arrangement of the petals in terms of how are they arranged as a, in, in the entire flower. We can have them cupped, rather fleck, flat or reflex so that uh, everything except for the lip is pointing backwards. The lip itself as the major character can be a, like a shield so that the top of the lip actually extends past the column on the top. We can have them T-shaped or also with all sorts of interesting processes. Now on the bottom right, those two flowers are actually from the same species and you notice they look quite different. And that is a good indication of intraspecific variability. And so that's variability within a species. Particularly I want to draw your attention to the bottom rightmost flower and look on the left and the right hand side. These two processes are very different. So this is an excellent indication if you have variability on one and the same flower, that is clearly on the same species. So there is variability within the species and we cannot discount that. Very important point to keep in mind. Now, when you have an electron microscope, what do you want to do? Zoom in and have fun. And so that is really where it gets interesting. There are also all sorts of cell types found on these flowers. And you can see there are discrete different types. And the very top left, you even see that the cell surface sculpture changes radically from striate on the left to pneumate, like a balloon in the center, to rugulate with wrinkles to the right, and that over very short distances. So obviously this is not an artifact due to preparation, and also this is under active control by the actual organism. So the question then arises, what is that for? And we will address that in just a moment. But first we should have a look also at the sac. You may have seen that before. There's a cavity in the center, we can cut that along the scissor line and we see that there is a sac, a depression formed like a nectary. And of course you wonder how is that cut? With, obviously not with the scissors, although I use the scissor symbol for cutting, but actually you will laugh, I actually did it with a pair of scissors, just very small scissors that would also be used in your surgery. Two millimeter blade, so if you use small, if you're working on small organisms, you use the appropriate small tools. That sac is actually quite variable by itself, can be a shallow depression, deep one, and in the bottom, these three examples show actually double tap. You see double tap in ceramica and bricata and gracilis. And then we can also have the sac, sac kind of in a negative form, inverted as an inflated disc. And then hairs, oh, they're everywhere. 
and they can actually help me to identify species. They can be long and uh, tenderly, rather stubby on the pediceled ovary, on the front of the lip, but also some don't have hairs. It's not always that there are hairs on these particular flowers. And so the question then arises, with all that detail, morphological detail, what's it for? Who pollinates Oberonia? I was asked that quite a bit, and I was wondering that myself. And so to answer that question, I thought, well, I need to look at these flowers through the eyes of a likely pollinator. And the likely pollinator are not bats, they're not birds, they're most likely small insects. So I need to basically simulate insect visions. Some of you may be aware that insects have special eyes that can actually see into the ultraviolet. At the bottom left, you see a spectral diagram. You see from 300 to 400 nanometers, that's the UV range. From 400 to 700 nanometers, that's visible light. And so I can now use a ultraviolet light source, use a camera that has been modified to actually sense ultraviolet lights, and then use special filters, like for instance, the Bader U filter, which is the blue line that only lets uh, ultraviolet light, light through, is completely black to the human eye, and then photograph these flowers and see what does, do they look like for insects. That's the result. At the top left, you see it in visible light. It looks like entirely orange flower, not much differentiation. Pure UV below it, we see that the flowers are kind of golden color, but the back is more bluish in color. And then with the bug U and the bug U5 filters, we see that the lip is a little bit darker. What does that mean? So there are certainly no major nectar guides, no lines found on these flowers, as we can see sometimes, or also what is often seen is a so-called bull's eye pattern, particularly in sunflowers. We don't see that at all. So that indicates that most likely the pollinator is visually rather unsophisticated. Second also, insect eyes are different from our eyes in that they have individual facets, so-called omatidia, and they are reducing the resolution limit uh, by which the insects can see. And that means that all these differences that we can see on these photographs are actually only visible to an insect from a distance of maybe five to 10 centimeters. So they're only good for the final approach, not for long distance attraction. So then, so we have a little bit of the mystery solved. Most likely it's small uh, dipterans, small gnats and flies that pollinate them, but we still don't quite know for sure who does it. Eventually, we do know that the pollination does happen and the orchids are forming seed capsules Usually they're just drab colored, only in one species so far, I found a very nice red one. And then they form seeds. And at the very top, you see a seed, an individual seed of an Oberonia. You see the scale bar that is 50 micrometers. That's a 20th of a millimeter or 400th of an inch roughly. So it's very small. It is one, Oberonia have some of the smallest seeds among the orchids. The orchids have the smallest seeds of all the flowering plants. So Oberonia seeds are some of the smallest seeds amongst all the flowering plants on the entire world. So that's not bad. And then also they look cool, don't they? And that they almost look arty. And so here, because the science pub is always a little bit more personal, I also give you a little bit of an insight into what does a curator do on the day off? I like to listen to some music. And so that's my music listening room. I needed to put some sound panels up and I used one of these orchid seeds, which of course will also serve as a, as a discussion starter once we are opening again and can receive some visitors. But now let's go back to actual science after this little detour. Another question is when insects are visiting flowers, often they receive a reward of some sort. Often it's nectar, and uh, nectar it could be found in, the, in that sac, in that depression. The question though is, is it actually there in the flower when it's alive? And so it is really hard to see that with a light microscope. Um, and so I wanted to investigate that with a scanning electron microscope. But live flowers, water containing flowers and an electromicroscope with high vacuum does not mesh terribly well. But what we can we do? 
is we can use environmental scanning electron microscopy or ESEM approaches. What we do is we put the flower on a cold stage just above freezing, so to reduce the vapor pressure. And then we put a lot of water vapor into the chamber, 500 to 800 Pascal. So that's roughly uh, 0.1 to 0.05 bar or atmospheres. Compare that to the, uh, the electron gun, which is under a vacuum of 10 to the power of minus five or minus six. So we have a differential a pressure differential of 10 to the power of nine. And that is still maintained within the instrument, which is quite a technological feat. So once we do that, what can we figure out? Oh yeah, this is a, a image actually of our new scanning electron microscope, the uh, Zeiss Evo 10 LS. At the bottom, you see the entire instrument with the control keyboards while control focus and magnification. We have at the bottom, the chiller, the cooling fluid providing uh, instrument that sends an umbilical cord, the chiller hose into the chamber and cools our specimen. And on top, you see all control panels with detector controls, the main SCM parameters, that's actually seven sub panels, stage navigation, we can control the cool stage and the ESEM parameters. So it's quite a technological onslaught. And what we figure out from that is, if you compare now, for instance, a variable pressure SEM uh, image where we take a live flower, we first preserve it in ethanol, then we critical point in liquid carbon dioxide and we sputter coat it in gold. And then we hope that that actually looks like nature. But we don't know whether possibly all these, these solvents actually dissolve the nectar out of the sac. So if you do it now, ESIM approach, we take a flower, we put it at no preparation, we put it into the SCM and we look at it and we still find no liquid in the sac, but also the whole cellular structure look very similar. So there's no actual alteration in our SCM prep for normal SCM compared to life preparation. So you may wonder, oh my goodness, no result, no liquid, that's pretty much a letdown. In fact, it is not. It's actually a really interesting result. And that has to do with a so-called deceptive pollination strategy that is used in orchids. Essentially, orchids are cheaters. They are attracting the, the insects, come to my flower, visit it, maybe you get a reward. And I say, na 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 na, no, nothing there. And they don't have to expend any energy on it, so they win. And so we have now here a very good example of another example of a deceptive pollination strategy in one of the orchids. So there's actually interesting biology coming out of this study. One thing you may notice in the top right fl flower is you see these black spots. You may have noticed those before and you may have wondered, what is that? And so I also wondered, what is that? And the first question I had, is that something on the surface or is that something deep down? And so I then used the SCM, the mass scanning electron microscope, and adjusted some parameters. And I adjusted the accelerating voltage. And with low accelerating voltage, up to two, one to two kV kilovolt, that is, we get a pure surface um, image because the electrons are of, of insufficient energy that they could penetrate the tissue. And we see nothing, just normal cell surfaces, not on the surface. As I increase now our voltage from 5, 10, 20, even 30 kV, suddenly we see, oh, you know, there is something underneath. Look at that, needles. That's kind of cool. I think, oh yes, needles, they're known. They're known in plants, they're referred to as raphides. Raphides are composed of calcium oxalate, but then also occasionally plants also make silicon compounds, silicon needles, particularly in grasses. The question, hmm, which one is it? So maybe you should do a chemical analysis. How do we do that? We now use another a technique called energy dispersive spectroscopy, where we measure the signal, the chemical signal that comes off from the sample. I put a spot onto these bundles and I find a lot of calcium signature in there. I put it outside in the general cell area without these needles and we get very little, 10 times less calcium. It's not zero because all cells contain some calcium, but it's quite a bit lower. So yes, these seem to be uh, calcium components. I can't tell you whether it's oxalate, but that's a reasonable assumption. So then the question arises, 
are all these black spots that we're observing, are there all these calcium uh, oxalate structures and are all the calcium oxalate structures showing up as these dark spots? So I use then a different technique and that is uh, energy dispersive spectroscopy mapping. So what we're doing here is at every single spot on the image, we get a small uh, spectrum and then make an image, a map of these calcium concentrations. And what we notice is that all the black spots are indeed calcium deposits. However, some of the calcium deposits are not showing up in the secondary electron image. Now, one of the, that's cool result, but it means now that I need to go through all my samples, several hundred samples and analyze them for these EDS maps. Now, a regular image takes me about a minute and a half and EDS maps takes about four hours. So that's quite a bit of time investment. And then in a sense, we have to look at the positive of the pandemic. I couldn't go to the museum too frequently, but what I can do is just quickly dash in, turn on the SCM, set it on for, for run, four hour run and walk away. And I then come back the next day and I have my results. That's wonderful. So make the most out of the resources and the circumstances that you have. So all interesting results coming out of here. So now we have an understanding of all the diversity. Let's see that how that holds up in the context of a phylogeny, so an evolutionary consideration. And we talked a little bit about some of the characters. We have now a molecular phylogeny um, that was done by Tina Hederick at the University of Potsdam as her bachelor's uh, thesis that where I was a co-advisor on. And we find, for instance, in green, we have one of the subgroups called Myosurus that has these pencil-like to read leaves and all of those species are grouping together. So that looks great at the begin with. However, we only have multiple samples of a single species. So hooray, the species holds up together, that's great. But we didn't have any samples from the other two species that are in this particular group, so the jury is still out. We looked already several times at the shield-like lip in blue, and we see that that is occurring several times on the tree. So that is not a good character for grouping the species. The thread-like appendages in Arachnochylus in yellow over there we have just two species, but they are holding up together. So tentatively, that might be a good character, as is also the T-shaped lip, lip for which we have four different species, and that may also hold up. So there is some progress going on, but the final word is certainly not spoken, also because the sampling is still rather limited. If we look at the distribution and the diversity of the group, it is basically found in the tropical part of the Indo-Balayan archipelago and then extends to the east over to Africa with a single species and to the west, sorry, and then to the east um, to French Polynesia. Highest concentration diversity we find in New Guinea, but there are also lots of synonyms that we'll talk about this later. Are there geographic patterns? And here, what I particularly was wondering about is, is Africa. Is Africa, with, with a long uh, shot away from the main group, is that very different? And no, not at all. It's just one species among the many. And here we have to remember again what the seeds are looking like. They're the smallest seeds among all the angiosperms, among all the flowering plants. So therefore, wind dispersal of those seeds is very easy. Therefore, it's no surprise that we don't see a whole lot of grouping in these particular trees. In green, also the Philippine species that are only occurring in the Philippines all over the place. In Taiwan, we have a couple grouping together, could be just an artifact. And then we have a bunch of widespread ones so they don't tell us much. So basically not a whole lot of geographic signature. Now, Let's look a little bit at uh, taxonomy as well, the naming of species. And that is basically the museum business of what we're doing. If you are an orchid grower, and I bet some of the people here in the audience are orchid growers, you obtain your plants, you get a label with your plants and you think, yes, that's the species I have. Well, be careful with that. Because if you look at the minor orchids, if you look at the trade name on the left and the correct name to the right, you see all these red arrows. These are all misidentifications. 
So that means that most of the species in the trade are misidentified. You see, for instance, at the top right, I obtained that as a species called Rufilabris, the red-lipped one, but this flower is green. So there are these misidentification are occasionally rather um, striking, and it bears in mind to not rely on these names that are coming with the label. So one of the problems with orchids is also that at least in the microflora ones, most likely there are too many species names floating around. And that is almost a heretical statement because orchids are a poster child of conservation. They need to be protected. There are lots of undiscovered species. And here I come along and say, actually, um, there are too many names. Many of these names are one and the same biological species. And I'll show you that with a couple of case studies. The first is Oberonia equitans. And you see at the top all these original illustrations, the common feature, particularly the, the petals, the skinny things sticking up towards um, 11 and 1 o'clock. They're fairly narrow, and the lip at the bottom has two lobes, and the, the tips of the lobes are uh, serrated. They're, they have jagged eggs, ed edges or also so-called erose. And you see that in most of the species. There are a couple of exce exceptions. On the third one from the left, Morcalensis, you don't quite see that serrated edge. But once you read the description, it says, well, this was done from a poorly preserved specimen. And a poorly preserved specimen, unfortunately, is not a different species. It is just poorly preserved. And then we look over to the third one from the right, Oberonia ciliolata, and that looks quite different, doesn't it? So you don't have that bifurcation at the tip of the lip, and we see now also the serrations on the side of the entire lip. Very different. And that's the drawing by Hooker, the person who actually drew the plant. So how do I think that this is actually the same species as all the other ones? I want to draw your attention to the one below that illustration by J.J. Smith. And if you look at the J.J. Smith illustration of Cilulata, you compare it to Inuensis or Oxystophyllum, they're indistinguishable. Now, punchline. Hooker and the Smith illustrations, those two both, both illustrations of Cilulata, they are made from one and the same specimen. And so they should basically look exactly the same. And here we're coming back to the original statement where I said, you know, drawings can be misleading. Here we have a very misleading drawing by Hooker, by the original describer, and only through examination of additional material, we can actually figure out that we have basically another synonym of, of um, equitants. Now, you may say, well, this is just morphology. Um, what, does, what does the DNA say about it? And here we can actually say quite a bit about with the DNA. This started out with a collaboration with a colleague from the Smithsonian Institution, Benjamin Crane, who found an Oberonia in Palau and asked me, what is it? So we had some material from Palau, sequenced it, compared it to some material from elsewhere and noticed, well, that's all the same. You will also notice at the bottom, the ones with the purple dots are all from Palau. And they show a certain amount of variability indicated with this orange bar. That is, that orange bar indicates the intraspecific variability that is also extant, existent with molecular data. It's not just morphological variability, there is also molecular variability. And if you look at some of the other species where we have multiple samples, they also show some variability, particularly in Rufilabris, a really easily recognizable species, quite a bit of variability, quite a bit more as in Paloensis. And then we notice that the sample in Equitans from French Polynesia, the third one from the bottom and two above from Samoa and another one from the Solomons, they are actually geographically further apart from all the Palau specimens. So we have more genetic variability on one small island of Palau than between Palau, French Polynesia and Samoa. So that means widespread mixing and again, we're talking about the seeds. I'll show you the seeds at the bottom right on the electron micrograph. These are a little bit larger. These seeds can easily wind dispersed and uh, therefore mixing, genetic mixing is quite likely. 
Second example <clears throat> is with um, Oberonia heliophila. This is a giant among the upper Oberonia. The individual leaves can be up to 75 centimeters in length. That's two and a half feet. So that's not a microscopic plant. They have a very thickened leaves, a beautiful, typically green colored lip, and then tan colored rest of the flowers. And again, if you look at some of the drawings and also the original specimens at the top, I show you some of the original specimens, one from the um, Smithsonian Institution on the left with Heliophila and Hosokawe and isotypes I found in Michigan. Uh, we see this is just intraspecific variability. We, we cannot determine any additional characters that could separate those particular species. And then the upshot of it all is, <clears throat> if you look at a broader geographic scale, I give you the range of these two species and every single star indicates the type locality for all the different names. Type locality is the specimen, the, the location where the original specimen was found. And what you notice is, particularly in Equitans, every single island has its own name. And that comes back to the idea, to the, the implicit assumption that Oberonia are, or orchids in general, are highly diverse, over diverse, they are underdescribed, and if it's not known from this particular island, this particular morph, therefore it is undescribed, therefore it must be new, it must be redescribed. Sorry, that is really not the case. If you look at the biology, particularly at the seed, the small seed, we see a gigantic uh, dispersal potential, and that is actually verified by molecular data. So the morphology tells us we need to be a little bit more generous in our species circumscription. We see the same also with Oberonia heliophila, a little bit different, particularly in Papua New Guinea. You notice that several workers were describing the same species over and over because they were unaware of each other's work. That now has also implications for conservation. Particularly in Australia, there has been one species, Oberonia attenuata, that was considered um, extinct and was on the big fanfare, was rediscovered. It turns out it's actually just a southernmost extension of a fairly widely distributed species elsewhere, Insectifera. So therefore, uh, these assessments of species ranges and uh, geographic ranges of species have broad implications also for conservation active management of such, such species. So then in summary, what I can say is, so we have some around 150 to 300 species, the jury is still out. Most of the plants are misidentified and we have many synonyms. So far I identified 60 species or names that are synonyms, but I'm not done by a long shot. So the number of actual species is going to be reduced as we move forward. I think I provided quite good evidence that microphotography and SEM, electron microscopy, is the preferred approach to study such microscopic uh, organisms and that the flowers have a lot of information. So with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Daniel. We do have one question. I believe Paige is referring to when you were looking at whether there was sac in, or fluid in the sac or not. Yes. And she is saying, could it be that nectar is only secreted during the pollinator's active hours, whether that's at night or at day? Certainly possible. I'm not aware of time-specific nectar secretion. There is time-specific scent. There are certain orchids that are particularly the moth pollinated ones that are more fragrant at night. That is fairly well known. I wonder whether nectar can be secreted and particularly then also resorbed again on a diel um, uh, rhythm. I would, would be, it's an interesting idea. I haven't seen anything in the literature and I have not observed it myself. And unfortunately, I also have to use the SCM more or less during office hours. So um, I would have to talk with security about getting access at midnight to the SCM. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Chris has a question. Thanks, Chris. Has there um, been any level of DNA description thus far for these amazing plants? 
You know, descriptions based on DNA, not as far as I'm aware of. So there are certainly DNA sequences available for my particular plant, for plants in general, absolutely. There, if that refers to that recent paper on what is it, 300 newly described flies that was done purely on DNA, if that is the what, what the what Chris is hinting at, that of course is a highly controversial paper. Uh, we can discuss that maybe on a different occasion, but that sort of approach has, to my knowledge, not been taken in, um, in orchids. It's almost the other way around, which is interesting. So uh, orchids are generally described based on morphology, but then when I do this heretical uh, deed of saying, sorry, these two are the same, it, 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 they look the same, they are the same, then suddenly people want to have DNA data to support that, but not if when you introduce it. So you can introduce it with morphology, no problem, but if you want to remove it, you need DNA. Okay, thank you. Um, there aren't any questions. So if you have a question, feel free to, to type it in and we'll answer it. I do have a question though. Um, sure, sure. You, you, when you were going over how you prep the flowers and you're saying ethanol and then drying and all of that makes sense, but then you totally glossed over what the gold plating was for. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, I, I sure glossed over a lot of the methodology that would be a talk in itself. Okay. Um, when you, when you put the, a flower or any sort of specimen into the electron microscope, you bombard them with electrons. Oh. So these are negatively charged particles. And uh, usually biological specimens made out of carbon are not conductive. They're not made of, made of metal. So therefore you get a buildup of electrons on the surface of these uh, organic structures. And eventually there's so much buildup of electrons that there will be a flash discharge. And it's like flashing in your eyes when you have a camera. And that is not terribly helpful when you're taking pictures. So the way you solve that is that you provide at the very surface a metal layer. And that is with evaporated gold that is done in a specialized machine so that I don't paint that on. Oh no, that is not possible. We yeah. <laughs> use a spotter coder where you evaporate gold in an argon atmosphere, and then it's deposited at a few angstroms, so a few atoms layer thick, so it will not obscure any of the structures. Hooray, we wow. like that. There that is, however, nowadays also the possibility that we can forego that coding, and there are different approaches. There is variable pressure SEM, and then also, for instance, when I talked about the environmental microscope, there just take a flower by itself, no coding, and mm -hmm. I still put it in the SEM. I bombard it with electrons and still no charging. And so here, essentially, the water molecules and the air in the chamber are serving the function of, I call it lightning rod. And so they are controlling the discharge. So there are all sorts of technological ways to address that. Yeah, OK, that makes sense. Thank you. I've um, got a few more questions. Laura sure. asked, how did you decide to work with Orchid? She says, I knew that you were pretty skillful with mollusks, but this topic <laughs> is pretty great too. And I can see that you like it a lot. Thank you. Yes, I'm having a blast, as you can tell. And so, uh, yeah, the question of why orchids, that actually, that goes back, to, I started in the beginning with Sandra Swoboda and she introduced me to um, one of her friends and said, oh, this is Daniel, he likes Oberonia. And so then that friend looked at me and said, after a while, why? And so in the orchid world where you have beautiful, large flowers, why would possibly, would you look at the smallest, most indistinct, the most painfully to look at, difficult to grow orchids? And for me, um, I always like the underdog. That's just my nature. When I work with snails, I looked at a family of snails that were basically people told me, oh, forget it, you will never be able to solve that problem. And then 12 years later, I had a book out. So now um, I'm still, I'm doing the same with these orchids. People have told me, uh, you know, you got your work cut out for it. For it. Um, a, in a book by Comber, I said, it said, 
I try to quote that it will take a brave taxonomist, so someone stupid enough to tackle this, to tackle this particular problem. Now, in a sense, it's, it's good that I'm not a professional botanist, so I have a little bit of fool's freedom. I can do whatever I want. And, uh, uh, and therefore, I think that helps in really untangling some of these knots. I'm not beholden to a tradition. I'm not beholden to what other botanists think. I'm not beholden to whether this is in line with what one should think in, in the context of conservation. I'm just saying it how it is. That's what I find. This is how I see it. Here's my data. That's how I publish it. And that works for me. And then also, it's a group that nobody wants to touch. And I like that. So therefore, I don't have to worry whether someone else publishes on it. If I sit on some data for a few years, eh, big deal. Nobody's going to steal it. I showed you here today some unpublished data, which is kind of, you know, you don't do that in science. And uh, am I worried about it? No, nobody can do this. So therefore, yes, I share it with you. These EDS maps, they're actually really cool. That's something very novel. And you've seen it here first on Science Pub at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Isn't that something? It is something. You definitely carved out your own corner um, there. So that's awesome. A few more questions. Are sure. there any morphological similarities discernible from mollusks and orchids? or your studies? There are similarities in terms of looking at fine detail and looking at a with high resolution microscopy, in a sense, at a level of detail that is one order of magnitude too big than would actually be necessary. That really helps. And so in this, uh, and the point is, once you see it with an electron microscope, there's just absolutely no question whether it's there or, there or not. And the same is also true for mollusks. You put a microshell under an electron microscope, you look at that protoconch, the larval shell, you have no doubt the feature is there, period, the end, proof. And so there is no squinting of the eyes. There's not kind of, oh, if I try a little bit different lighting, maybe I may be able to bring it out. No, I know it's there or no, it's not there. And so there are certain parallels there. What's also interesting though, from kind of a biological and kind of thinking approach is that the study of botany and zoology is very complementary. So in, in zoology, we have individuals, one shell, and that's it, that's the entire individual. In a plant, we have multiple flowers, hundreds of flowers, all have a little bit of variation the plant grows, they adapt to different environments. So they're quite a bit more plastic. And that actually is an issue to be addressed and just to wrap your head around of how can I address this variability? And that is still an ongoing struggle. So it's a good idea, or for me, it has been really helpful to look at two very different systems and learn lessons from both and apply them to the other field. So it's not that I'm just wasting my time from one to the other, but they actually help and provide a better overall picture of all of biology. Those are good answer. Thank you. Um, from, another one from Chris. Thank you. Has anyone attempted to breed these tiny orchids and or experiment with cross pollination? Excellent question. And I say, Thank you, no. <laughs> and why do I say that? <laughs> that may sound like a very strange answer. Now, in orchids, breeding and cross and making hybrids is a, a sport. It's a business, even. And one of the people that is also supporting our pro program, um, George Hatfield of Hatfield Orchids down in Ventura, he makes his livelihood breeding cymbidium orchids. However, from a biologist's perspective, I'm interested in the species. So if someone now starts to interbreed the species, they are diluting and mixing the, the raw material and make my job much harder. So thankfully, nobody, to my knowledge at least, has even tried to do breeding. The other issue is also um, breeding takes some time and effort. Fertilizing these flowers is not easy. Actually, I tried and I failed. I can tell you that. That's one of my failed experiments. So still one or two things to learn. 
And uh, then you have to grow the seeds. Then you have to grow the seeds up in a sterile environment and so on. That takes time, it takes money. And eventually as a commercial vendor, you want to recoup your investments so you need to be able to sell those. However, nobody cares about those particular orchids, these small ones, that's just how it is. So therefore it's commercially not viable to engage in such a foolish act as trying to um, cross fertilize, make hybrids of these particular Oberonia species. There is one report in the literature of one natural hybrid, and it's Oberonia hybrida, properly named, and that's the only indication I've ever seen about hybrids. Not yet, anyways. Not yet, yes. <laughs> um, okay, just two more questions and then we'll get going. Um, Kathy, asks, uh, you mentioned a lot of papers or a few papers in your talk. Is there somewhere where she can find these papers? Do you have like- a Oh, absolutely, yes. So there is a, a research paper repository called ResearchGate, researchgate.org. Um, you can Google or search my name and you will find it. And there is a project director with Ober that's called Oberonia and has something like a dozen papers in there. Um, and then also all my mollusks paper are there. If you can't find it, please just send me an email and I can also email you a PDF. You find the email on the website and I certainly, this is a, a true open invitation. If you've got question, also things that come up later, please feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to, to talk to you and give you further information. Awesome. Thank you. I think that wraps up um, our Q&A portion. So I just want to thank everybody for coming and thank you, Daniel, for joining us. And um, we will see you. Uh, I will see you again on May 10th for our next Science Pub from Home, Humans and Mountain Lions in California with my previous advisor, Chris Wilmers, a PhD professor of wildlife conservation at UC Santa Cruz. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye.